Hello everyone and welcome to this live stream. Right, I'm just getting heaps of pop-ups of that type of thing now, but I actually think I am live now. So how is all going? Um, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, it's going to be a live sort of Q&A uh, with whoever decides to come online and we'll just chat about what's been going on in the past year, um, a few questions that have been sent in already and just any questions that you have as we go along, please um, jump online and uh, let me know. If there's a delay in the in the, in the the sound, please let me know because it's looking like a bit of a delay on my end. Um, I'm not sure why that's happening, but it's really distracting. But uh, anyway, so I guess crazy uh, 2020, obviously, um, we couldn't race. It was obviously a bit of a, a step back for me coming from a, a big uh, 2019, sort of finishing the, I guess, the the overall APP World Tour, winning the Distance Race World Series, winning the ICF World Title, winning the Euro Tour again, um, and then start obviously starting off the year strongly, winning Carolina and those type of events. So huge year for me in 2019, and then to come into 2020 uh, and have it all sort of shut down in March. And I, I was I guess I was over in Thailand and, and seeing all the crew over there, and uh, wasn't able to continue throughout the season like I normally do. We tested out the boards, we were all excited and ready to go, and then borders shut and no racing for for a long period of time. So, um, yeah, so I guess it was a, a different year for me, but I'm stoked I had it. I guess I was a bit burnt out at the end of 2019 and, and now really feeling refreshed and ready to go and, and getting back into some training now. So uh, thanks, Peter, for signing in and, and saying g'day from Switzerland, uh, one of my booth training clients, mate. It's been really good working with you. If, if anyone else is online and wants to say g'day from where they're coming in from, please please do. It's, it's always good to see that people are actually online and, and actually joining in. So please say good day. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, coming into 2021, I guess I'm pretty refreshed. I'm pretty keen to get back into some some rigorous training, which I've, I guess I'm already doing, which is quite exhausting, um, given a, a bit of a, a bit more of a rest period back in 2020. But um, focusing going forward is obviously getting back out there and getting racing, hopefully getting over to the Hungry World Champs, uh, the Euro Tour and uh, maybe APPs, ISA back at back end of um, 2021. But we'll just have to wait and see what happens with the, the lockdowns and the, and the virus and, and all the different things that are happening around the world. It's, uh, it's pretty uncertain still, but I feel like there's a bit of light at the end of the tunnel as we're going along. Hello, Jan. Thank, thanks for saying good day from Czech. Pete from Melbourne. Mum from Gold Coast. Thanks for signing in. Always good to see you. Are you guys getting a delay? Can, that, can someone let me know on the comments if you're getting a delay or it's just on my end because um, there's a quite a big delay uh, coming through here. Hello, Ralph from Germany. So I've got a few questions uh, that were sent in prior to the broadcast. So I'm going to get them up now and we're going to talk through a few of those. So the first question that we had was actually from Peter. So Peter, thanks for signing in. I'm going to answer your question first. Now his question was, how am I? I'm good. Um, how is the ratio among pro athletes? Do, I some, do you sometimes train together or do you train alone? Do I like to train alone? I guess the first part of that question, um, do we all train together or do we train, do we train alone? I think a lot of us are training uh, in groups generally. I think there's a lot of different um, sub paddling groups around the place, but obviously being at that elite level, you do have to do a lot of paddling by yourself, especially if you're traveling around the place. Um, I know I've trained um, with Lincoln, Lincoln Jews, like obviously over in um, Europe, I've, I've trained with a lot of the French guys as well. So I guess you've got a common um, interest and a common theme. So you're happy to get out in the water and, and train together when you are traveling. Uh, when you're at home, you're a bit more disjointed and sometimes it's a bit harder to get on the water with everybody. So you do uh, do your own workouts a lot. I tend to train a lot by myself when I'm over here in Perth, but I, I do have like ski paddling groups, sub groups and, and all different um, members of the community that I do go and paddle with. So it's a, it's a bit of a mixed job, but um, I, I do like training alone. Um, I love whacking my headphones on, listening to a book or um, listening to some music and just getting the, that aerobic uh, work done. Uh, sometimes it's a bit harder when you're doing that speed stuff to be able to listen to a book, but the music is always good. Uh, but 
I guess when you when you're doing a lot of sessions, you do want to be able to be jumping on the water with other people and just getting motivated. Because sometimes when you're getting to the, I guess the back end of the weeks when you're really tired, you just you don't really want to do it anymore. So it's always nice to to have somebody else turning up and knowing at five o'clock in the morning or whatever it is, you've got somebody else getting on the water with you, which I, I definitely need sometimes. Uh, thanks to Sergio and Patricia for letting me know that there is no delay. G'day Greg, g'day Rocio, uh, Rocio, sorry. Um, hello Philippe from Germany um, and Cora. I will get to your question in a second. I'm just going to jump on these questions that I've got already from the people who have uh, jumped on Instagram and Facebook prior to the, the broadcast. Um, Chris has uh, Chris Koo from South Africa has asked, do I publish my GPS recorded sessions anywhere on Garmin Connect or Strava? If so, where can you follow? Um, well, the best answer to that would be to say that I have a booth training um, online community that you can jump on and be involved with. Um, uh, I do give away a lot of my training secrets in that. So if you want to jump on and, and have a look at that, uh, michael-booth.com.au forward slash booth-training, um, a whole bunch of uh, sessions, info, community groups, all that type of stuff, and, and that's how I've been helping people in that type of thing. Probably don't want to give too much away in, in terms of my training sessions right now while I'm still trying to race and, and win races because I guess there's always someone watching. So I'm always trying to keep a little bit little bit held um, on, on my side, but there's definitely a lot of um, information I'm giving away through my, my online training community. So if you want to get involved with that, you definitely can. Um, so... And the next question was, how much running and mobility training contributes to my weekly sub training regime? Uh, I think when I'm, I'm in a, a bigger training block, I, I'm always um, doing a lot of running, um, probably like three times a week or something like that. And then when I'm getting into mobility and strength, probably another three times a week as well. So there's a lot of, um, I guess, running and, and training um, with the core, core exercises and that type of thing, strength sessions. Um, just to really build me up, I guess, when I'm doing pre-season training, those sessions will go from, say, 30 minutes running to an hour running or something like that. And then once I move away and I'm racing on the, on the scene, it's, it's back back down towards half an hour or something like that, just trying to maintain and, and stay strong when I'm overseas. Um, and then gym. Our gym can be up upwards towards four or five times a week, and then it can sometimes be nothing. So it just depends on which part of the season we're in and, and what we're trying to achieve at that point. So... I've got different methods that I use for that. So again, if you, if you really want to be helped out in that sort of area, please check out Booth Training. Um, SUP Magazine just reached out, so they they want to interview me soon, which is great. So um, they're going to jump online, they reckon, and, and ask me a few questions. I'll ask, uh, I'm going to jump over to one of the questions asked by one of the audience now. So Cora's asked, what is the best body weight simple exercise to do at home to get in shape for supping for a beginner? I think uh, the best core exercises, so I guess when I say core, I like to think basically from under my chest down to my knees. I think that's kind of like your core stability for your stand-up paddling. So anything I find that bridges, single leg bridges, um, lunges, um, then you can go into anything that's sort of working that lower abs, so leg raises like flooded kicks, um, sit-ups, uh, planks, side planks, um, Russian twists, all those type of exercises are going to be really good for you. Um, and then if you're just a beginner, just start with maybe five, ex five reps or something like that, or 30 seconds if you can do that. And then as you get more advanced, you do it for longer and, and you get better at it and you add weight. That's generally how I start to implement it. So that's hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Philippe from... Heilbronn, Germany. Hopefully I've said that right. What is the starboard collection for wing surf and are the boards compatible with the premium hydrofoils as Moses Leviats? I, I don't know um, Moses Leviats, but um, the starboard wings are, are, do, are doing really good. So I'm, I assume you're talking about foiling. Um, I think I'm really enjoying the E-Type 1300 and 1700. I'm also really liking the X-type wings, the 1100 for winging and that type, that type, those types. I think they're they're really fast now, and I think for downwinding and for surfing, they're quite easy, easy to use, nice to pump out, especially with the E-types. So if you want to check those out, check out your, your local distributor. You're going to always be able to find some great products from Starboard, and they're always trying to be the best. So 
I've never really worried about um, looking looking anywhere else, so it's always good. Um, Danny uh, Hailman, uh, thanks for jumping on. How much surski do I do versus sup? Do you see it as advantageous to do both? Do I feel they give both ways and how? Yes, I think surski and sup are very complementary, and I think it's guess been one of my like secret weapons in a way over the past. Um, I guess six years now since I've I've done stand up competitively since 2014. I guess I guess maybe seven years now since if we if we include 2020. Um, so I find I probably do half and half when I'm at home. So if I'm in a like a general training block, I might do three sup or four sup and three ski or um, just transfer between the two. I think they've got really good benefits. I find that surf ski is kind of like running and Sup is like running up hills, if that makes sense. Running, uh, I find sup is a lot more strength based. Um, it's it's heavier load when you are paddling through your stroke, whereas surf ski, I find it's a bit more rhythmic, so you're getting your heart rate up into that higher heart rate level. So you're sort of sitting in if you use something like Garmin levels or something like that, you in that L4 zone pretty um, consistency consistently. Whereas in, on the sup, I find that you're probably a bit lower in that L3, low L4. So it's just about um, finding those different zones and using them both, um, surf ski and sup, to, to build your fitness level. But when you get close to events, generally I tend to focus mainly on the, the, the craft that I'm going to be racing on. So, yeah, that's that's hopefully answered your questions, but definitely advantageous. And I think all water sports are fantastic. So it doesn't matter which one you're doing, it's always good to be um, out in the water and, I don't know, keeping it keeping it fresh. Uh, Sergio has asked, uh, how is the new sprint going? Um, I'm not sure which new sprint you're talking about. I assume the 021 uh, 14 by 1975. Um, that board's awesome. Um, paddled it yesterday. Been paddling it uh, throughout the last six months. I think the first time I raced it was in ICF in China last year. So, oh no, the year before that. Actually, that's crazy. Um, yeah, it's it's an awesome board. Nice and fast. Really responsive. It's 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 very versatile. Um, even at that width, I find it really stable, and i just it's just kind of a pity that we didn't get to race on it. But um, it's a it's an amazing board, and I think you should try it out. Find your local distributor and and go and check it out. Uh, Philippe, uh, which one do I recommend for a huge guy in wing surf, and why? Uh, it's it's hard to say. I don't know what your ability level is uh, for wing surfing. If if you're starting out, I just used the E Type 1700. Um, I found that was really easy to lift out of the water. wasn't super fast, um, but it, it just got me up quickly and allowed me to get along and, and work on the jives and that type of thing. Easy to pump, so if, if I was falling down, I could pump it up and and hold the wing. And as I got better, I used the 1300, and, and then as I got better again, I started using the X-Type 1100. I don't have, I think it's a 1300 or something like that, X-Type as well. I don't have one of them, so I can't really comment on that one. But, um, yeah, they're, they're all working really well. The X-Type's definitely the fastest one from my experience anyway. Okay, let's uh, let's jump back. Um, keep jumping on and saying good day if, you, if you're signing in. I'll, I'll try and give you a shout-out as we go along. Uh, really appreciate everyone signing in. Uh, Cora signed in from Boston. Uh, USA it must be it must be quite late there now. So thanks for signing in. Um, I'm going to go to this one. Why and when did I start paddleboarding? From PA5MT on Instagram. I'm not sure what that what that stands for. I'm probably going to I'm probably going to not going to try to say it. I started paddleboarding back in 2014. Now, basically, I was at the time doing a lot of flat water kayaking. Um, I actually signed my first ever um, sup contract when I was in Hungary in Zolnok uh, training for the under 23 kayaking world championships and the senior world championships in Russia of 2014 and I was doing um, a K2 1000 and K2 500 respectively and I just really thought I had this discussion actually on my podcast recently with Tim Jacobs and we were talking about how it's such a it's such a massive commitment to be doing those flat water sports and I think sports like stand up paddling and surf ski was something that I really enjoyed. I got to travel with my mates. I got to really experience um, different places and I really loved to travel and I just I just found it was more fun for me. My mind was already wandering, so I think that was something that I really wanted to do and and, and sup really gave me that opportunity. 
And it was also, I guess, why I got involved with it. I guess I'm a very competitive person and, and I love paddle sports. So I thought, hey, well, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to jump on a stand-up and just try it out. Um, Damien Gulliver was the guy who introduced me to stand-up and we were lifeguarding. I think it must have been 2013 summer and the Gold Coast. And then, yeah, I did my first races in 2014 and then took it seriously from really, really from 2016. Um, racing on like the full circuit, doing Euro tours and that type of thing. So, yeah, it was just it was just a sport that came naturally. I I started in surf life saving as a kid, did ocean ski, then kayaks, and then surfed a lot and did all those different um, ocean sports, and then eventually just jumped on and ended up um, finishing with with SUP. And I'm still doing surf ski, and I'm, I'm doing a surf life saving event this weekend with Sorrento. So, yeah, I just love getting out in the water and getting involved. It's just um, it's just intrinsic with me, and it's just the way I grew up. My parents, uh, we got involved in surf club when I was a really young kid and it was always around the water and I'm still doing it, which I'm, I'm very fortunate to be doing. Oh, so uh, Show Hampo from Instagram has asked, I have a disability, my right arm, I get tired quickly. Any tips to try and keep forward and straight? Um, I probably need a little bit more information on that, but um, as far as... If you're getting tired quickly, I assume you're getting tired quickly physically. So uh, one thing to do would be to get better endurance in your legs, um, like whether you're jumping on a cycle, you're, you're running, you're rowing, um, all those different things where you can really um, push up your endurance level on your legs. It'll make your upper body get less tired, which will allow you to be able to paddle for that little bit longer when you're on the when you're up, up and paddling. Uh, I'm not sure what level you're at, but, um, but if you want to ask me more questions after this, just um, let me know on uh, Michael Booth on Instagram or WhatsApp or anything like that. I'm pretty easy to find and pretty easy to contact. Uh, Raul, g'day, mates. Uh, hopefully get to see you soon. It's been a, a, long, a long 14, 15 months since we've seen you guys, so hopefully get over to Thailand soon. But do I change my fins between a long distance, a technical race, and a sprint? How do I choose which fin to use? Uh, yes, so I, I change fins all the time. Um, I've got the time trial from BMG for the, I guess, the flatter races. Like if we look back to the race in Ton uh, in Switzerland that one year where it's like really flat, there's not much going on. The time trial really works well because it's a long base fin. It attracts really well. Um, when I'm racing in surf, I'll use like a 35, which is like a bit of a more of a surf fin and it's got a bit more of a base um, and a bit more weight into it. And if I want to turn really fast, I'll use a smaller fin again um, and then um, I'll use a, a different fin altogether um, if there's a bit of weed or something like that. So definitely changing my fins all the time. Uh, there's also a thought process around if the further your fin goes back on your board, the more the, the better it's going to track and the further forward it is, the better it's going to turn. So there is those two different... Um, things that you got to be thinking about when you're choosing your fins and also how long your fin is, how, like, so if a wider fin, um, if you're looking from your, the nose of your board to the tail of your board, that's where you're going to get your better tracking. A narrow fin, you're going to get better turning. So there's all those different things you can got to be thinking about when you are racing. And, yes, I'm, I'm constantly changing my fin. I'm, I, I could change my fin on the start line sometimes even if I, if I change my mind. But generally I try not to do that. I've made a few mistakes previously in the past where, I've tried to change things at the start line and, and I remember Christy telling me I was already lost the race because I I was um, all over the place trying to, too much to worry about my equipment. So I guess my best tip on that is just learn your equipment, be confident in your equipment and when you're racing, um, you'll you'll find you're better off rather than trying to find some magical cure in getting a different fin. Uh, we'll jump back on to the live comments. Um, G'day Yvette, thanks for joining in from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, Oh, sorry. I'm going to give this give this name a go. Urakawa Takafumi. How many? Ask me how many races I'm going to participate in this year. Oh, I'd like to participate in a lot of races, um, but it's going to be very limited to um, what the world allows us to do, what the governments allow us to do, what the pandemic allows us to do. So, um, hopefully, I'd like to think I can get up into that dozen dozen races this year. Uh, especially towards the tail end of the year. Hopefully we can really start moving again and, and get out there and, and do some racing. Um, realistically, on my plan, I'd like to start racing in Bilbao, uh, then do the ICF Worlds, and then I think there's a race in Prague and maybe down in Greece as well. But that's all given if my government lets me out of the country, which I think I can as an athlete. Um, and then obviously 
I like this motion ski races. So there is a, a Sean Partners Foster Race Week over there in um, May next year, and then we'll next sorry next next month no May. So in May there'll be a Foster Race Week uh, for the surf skis, and then the next weekend there will be Twelve Towers, which will be a great event to participate in. Um, so I, I didn't do that one last year, which I kind of regret because it's the last race to do last race that was possible before the pandemic came down. So uh, yeah, it's it's really hard to say how many events I'll do, but I'll do as many as I can. Peter's asked, can you tell me the flight number to Europe? Is there any good news about that? Um, I think that's asking me if, if I can make it over to Europe. Um, I believe I can, um, and I will be if that is possible, of course. Um, I'd love to get over there and, and see all the SUP community over there in Europe. It is a, it's a place that's been very, very good to me. Uh, I've been lucky enough to meet some, so many great people and go to so many cool events. And Yeah, it's... Uh, I've been lucky to, to win a few, and I think it's really been a major part of my career. So it's, I guess, thanking guys like uh, Bella from Euro Tour, Tristan from the APP, and, and the guys who put the events on and, and make it all happen. And, and obviously the smaller organisers around the place who to do put it on, that's really important. Uh, G'day, Martin. Uh, says, hi, Booth. Raiko says, g'day from Indonesia. Uh, Rose asked, uh, flat water versus ocean water. What do I find more enjoyable to paddle in? Uh, oh, geez, that's a, that's a really loaded question in a way because I, I like paddling in both. I like when it's rough. I like when it's downwind. I like when it's really hectic and you almost like can't paddle out because it's blowing so hard and then you're, and you're cruising down the coast. But I find on the flat water, I absolutely love it as well. Like, it just there's nothing better than and when it's like glass still and you're paddling along, you've got a nice rhythm, a nice stroke, you're creating con like consistent and efficient and effective motion. Um, it's it's just awesome. So I really I really like all of it. Uh, I can't really pick one. Uh, sometimes the wind annoys me and, and sometimes the flat annoys me. But at the end of the day, there's always one or the other that you can jump in and get involved in. Um, Philip, if you want to find out more about the, the wings and the, the dings, yeah, I'm not sure which one you were talking about before, but you can check it out. Rothio, Rothio has just posted a link from the marketing team at Starboard. Raul's, his dad is here. I'm, I'm not sure what that means. You're going to have to back that up. Okay, so Demetrius says, where could we find decent training plans for SUP Marathon Race? Um, you can find decent SUP training plans on Booth Training. Um, check it out, michael-booth.com.au forward slash Booth Training. Um, I can definitely help you out with that. So get in contact if you like um, after this or on one of my social media pages and we can talk further or just check out Booth Training on uh, social media. Uh, Choppy Waters, g'day mate. It's been a while. What would the steps be to go from amateur to pro and to participate in SUP competitions from Dubai? Um, well, well, the steps would be hard work, um, lots of paddling, lots of training, um, and racing a lot. I think the the forgotten art in in a way of of getting better is is racing more. Like you have to go to races, you have to feel how it feels to race. You got to know the conditions, know your competitors, know um, how, how it is to race in those different circumstances. Where it's a sprint or a technical or a distance race, there's always these different things that you need to be doing all the time. So that's a key component. Then obviously a nice building um, training plan, I think really starting off nice and slowly depending on what your fitness level is. Working with a, a great coach, there's a lot of great coaches out there um, that you can work with. Um, it's very, people are very accessible these days with the internet, so myself included. But um, gradually building up with your training plan to a more advanced level and then sort of implementing that and then finding out what's realistic as well, I think, You've got to know what your background is, like what your age is, what your paddling background is, um, how willing you are to commit to training, how willing, how much time you actually have between work or family or all those types of things. So you have to really factor in so many different things. But if, if you're a young guy and you've got plenty of time, uh, the best thing to do is to find a mentor, to find a coach and to trust them, um, to work with them and, and you will get better. There's... It's, it's just basically as simple as that. There's there's no uh, hiding from hard work. Some guys get through in talent, but they won't be consistent for a long period of time. So yeah, just it's just hard work and, and enjoying what you do, like finding that it's your passion, that that's what it's got to be if you're going to devote a lot of time, a lot of years, a lot of effort to something. So hopefully that answers your question. 
Sergio has asked, uh, what is my average speed when long distance training? I think you'll find, depending on conditions, wind, variables and stuff like that, I think if you're doing like a hard L4 session, you're in that sort of six minute per kilometre range. And then if you're going faster, you're coming down from that, um, depending on what type of um, training session you are doing. But yeah, I think around that six minutes is what the races are going to be sort of around and then you're going to be up around that 11 I think to, to be winning races if it's dead flat that's just the way it is and that's how fast the guys are paddling now sometimes it's faster than that again so really depending on the conditions whether it's side wind or whether you've got headwinds or currents or pack racing and mentality and people want to play games so there's different types of stuff but when you're training I think around that that sort of 10 k's an hour is, is a really good average to be holding. Uh, Pete Jackson mate Another booth training uh, athlete, he is signing in from Melbourne. He's looking forward to catching up at 12 Towers. Will I be running any clinics on the GC? Yes, um, that is a good question. I'm looking at running one actually on the, must be the 9th of, 9th of April. I'm going to run one and then probably one around um, 12 Towers as well. So I'll get some information to you, mate, um, before then and I'll start posting these up. Um, it seems like we're going to be able to uh, travel a little bit more freely um, over the next year, at least here in Australia. No COVID in Australia, which is fantastic, and the borders are starting to open. I've been lucky enough to go to the Sydney and, and over to the Gold Coast three times now, so it's pretty cool. So I can start scheduling things. I did schedule a lot of clinics just in March of last year uh, before all the COVID restrictions came down and I had to cancel everything. So I've been very hesitant to book anything in but uh, now it's seeming like we can maybe start booking things. So, yes, there will definitely be clinics on, on the Gold Coast, potentially um, also in Melbourne and on the Sunshine Coast. So I'll be letting everyone know uh, via my social media channels very soon. Uh, Jan has asked, uh, what age would you include a sprint in your children's training? Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm thinking you're talking about the starboard sprint as in a board. I'll, I'll answer this question two ways. So um, if you want to bring bring in a race board, like a starboard sprint into training, I think probably if if they are really young, around that 10 to 15 age, probably like a, a one of those, the kids race boards that starboard sells or a 12 foot six, if there's any around there, they're probably a good starting points um, for those kids. And then as they get bigger and stronger, the the 14 foot boards will come into a factor. Basically when you, when you, training on a bigger board generally you're going to go faster because it's planning speed of a 14 foot board is going to be better than a 12 6 better than a 10 6 so you're going to be going fast and your average speed is going to be better regardless of how big you are you just got to probably vary the volume size and, and get a board that's more suited to lighter weight um, a lot of the i guess the boards that i race on like a 14 by 19.75 sprint is target around that 70 to 80 kilos um, might not be I don't know, hopefully that says that on the website but that's um that's what it is because I'm about 80 kilos, so I have to be upper end of the spectrum. And then you've got guys like Daniel and Connor around that 70 kilo mark. So it's got to kind of work between us, our, all, our, all our ranges, and, and obviously the girls as well with Sonny and, and Fiona. And, and those girls are about, or well, maybe maybe a bit less, but so maybe maybe 65 to 80. I don't know. I don't want to talk about weights too much. Um, and then for sprint training for kids, I think it's they can start it whenever. Uh, there's no real age where you shouldn't be doing sprinting. There's like there used to be talks of not getting involved in too much gym work or too much paddle sports as a kid, but I don't think that's that's true. I think you can get involved in paddling at any point, and you can you can start sprinting at any any point as well. So um, I think that hopefully answers your question in those in those two ways. Yep. So uh, Dad's actually got online. We used to do when I was a kid. It was actually the BSB skills training. I was actually reminiscing with the. Uh, with Sandra Jordan, the paddler, the other week on their podcast, and we're talking about how um, the training down at Case Beach and what we did with my dad was um, so so influential in my career because when when you're starting out, I think you don't realise how much your training when you're a kid is going to help you when you're older. So now coming into my my thirties, my thirties, geez, um, it's it's definitely changed my. My, my thought process on things, you think, oh, what we're doing now is really important, which it is, but what you've done for years and years and years and that consistency will breed results going forward. So that's something you need to be thinking about. Um, and thanks for signing in, Dad. Monica has asked, will there be a live talk about 
021 All Star. Uh, if there's enough interest, um, guys, mention in the comments if you do want a live talk about the 021 All Star, I can probably do one uh, in the next couple of months. I think I did one on the ace and the sprint, but I, I didn't actually end up doing one on the All Star. Um, so yeah, I can I can definitely do one. But if guys, if you want to if you want to see this, make sure that you do let me know in the comments. Oh, sorry, sorry, Yarn. I can see the 200 meters. When do you want? So I can see all your comments now. It's only I only see the ones that I've scrolled down to. Um, when should I bring in the 200 meter sprint for a, a young kid? Um, I think you can do it tomorrow. There's no, there's no um, age restriction. I don't think for going half 200 meters. So yeah, tomorrow, whenever. Um, another question I've got here is from Penny. Penny has asked, what is my average cadence at long distance race and what at technical? Uh, well, it's probably easy to say for long distance race, I think I'm around that 55 mark, um, which is, I think, pretty standard now. I think it's a pretty average between the fastest rating guys. It might be up around that 65 and then the lower rating guys around that 45. But I think on, on race pace, I'm about 55, um, pretty, pretty standard. And then... Depending on that, I, I vary in between. Uh, uh, average for technical would probably be around the same. It's just I would I would increase my rating a lot more at the start, and then I might sit wash, and then into cans you might not do many strokes. So it's going to change depending on when you're coming into cans and that type of thing, or buoys depending on which uh, country you're from. Now, uh, another one from Raul. Given the con that conditions change, can speed be used as a reference when training or heart rate? Or heartbeat and pace. So that's actually a pretty good question, and it's something that I, when I'm talking to my athletes with uh, booth training about how I actually structure my training, I don't actually use specific heart rate levels like I know a lot of people do, um, but I'm sort of, I, I never used a watch really until I turned about, I reckon about 25, or when I, probably when I started ocean ski paddling, I started using it a little bit, but I was always in squads, someone else always called start and stop, and I never really worried about it, and when my coaches said, "Okay, this one's going to be L L3," that was just always 80%, and then L4 was 90%, and L5 was 100%, or as hard as you can go. So, I think that you should really be focusing um, on your knowledge of your body. That's something that I think pe people forget about too much. Like they look at all their data and their stats and their heart rates, and I don't know their uh, what do they got now? Like there's all those sleep scores and, and all these different things. And it's like, okay, well, if you put all that down tomorrow, are you going to be able to survive? Are you going to be able to do your session without that knowledge? Like, can you just get a, I don't know, an old, I don't know, Casio or something that's just got a stopwatch on it and that's it. Can you, can you use that and go, okay, I'm going L4, I'm going L2. Like I'm going to be able to change my pace in my session, the way that I'm going to change my pace in the race. And I've got a, I think I've got a, quite a good little breakdown of how I look at my um, levels in training um, and that if for example like level one would just be talking um, chatting just cruising along with your friends level two would be um, I don't know just just gradually moving into your race not 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 paddling too hard just getting ready before the start just doing a nice little paddle into the start line uh, but keeping that nice technique and nice a uh, nice average speed but not really going too fast Level three, I'd look at it as, um, I'm just making this up. I've got actually a little chart that I do send people, but um, I'm usually using uh, level three as like middle of the race. I'm going to be able to maintain that pace all day. It's, it's my marathon pace. It's my distance race pace. Um, and that's, that's sort of where I sit most of the time. Level four is when I'm trying to hold a speed where I'm not allowing the pack to catch up or I'm trying to hold a speed that I'm eventually going to catch the pack in front. It's something that's a little bit, it's a little bit above aerobic threshold, and then I'd say a level three is a little bit below aerobic threshold. But you should be able to feel that intrinsically. You shouldn't need a watch to be able to tell you that. And then level five is as hard as you can go. It's, it's sprinting 200 meters. It's trying to get back onto a wash train. It's trying to break away. It's that sort of mindset. So I think my levels in training are based more around mindset than they are around um, around specific heart rate levels because it's not something that I used um, growing up. So Raul, I hope that answers your question, and I hope. Uh, you do get out there and do Molokai on the foil at some stage. I know we would, were aiming for that this year, but it never really happened. Um, let's go across so to the one of the pre pre talk questions. I'm just gonna have a little drink. 
Okay, apart from board models, it's from Rothio, from Starboard. If you had to pick a board from your quiver, which one would you choose and why? Do you know what? The board that I've actually been liking the most lately has been the, the longboard sub. Uh, I think it's 10 by 29. And it is such a good board. Like you go out there, you catch so many waves. It turns like a almost like a short board or a short board sup, and you just it just it's just so much fun. I actually have really enjoyed that board. So if I had to pick a board, it would definitely be that one. So go ahead on Starboard um, website and check that one out because it's it's definitely one you want to have in your quiver. So we've got Samantha from Bonaire in the Caribbean Netherlands. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, maybe maybe they're in both places. Do Sorry, do you know any of the pros who begin training, competing in later in life, say in their 40s? Um, do I know anyone who started training? I haven't seen any of the pros necessarily, but I have seen people really improve on their paddling, um, like starting paddling in their 40s. Like they have been triathletes from 30 to 39 or, I don't know, have been snow, like snow skiers or uh, people who've been involved in running or something like that and try to find a sport that's going to allow us to be a little bit low, more low impact but still get that nice um, endurance and aerobic feeling that we all sort of crave I think I know for someone like me I love I love being really fit it just it just feels awesome so um, yes there's definitely been people who've really stepped it up and improved uh, out of sight through their 40s that's that's no question I think with today's technology and, and people understanding their bodies so much more like there's no real reason why you can't be racing until you're 50 um, at, at a at a quite a strong level, um, uh, yeah, guys like I guess in the in the elite males are probably only represented. Like you had George Constant and you had Kelly Margetts race till he was winning race. I think he won his last race when he was like forty. And um, Travis Grant sort of you know, towards the end of his forties now in ocean ski paddling. You've got like guys like Hank McGregor or mid forties who are still winning races. Um, Dean Gardner, Oscar Chalopsky, like all these names who are like really good star paddlers through their 40s. Um, so you can definitely do it. Uh, there's there's no question. It's just a, a matter of how much time you can dedicate to it. And I think that's something that people forget um, going into their their later life. I think they have so many more other priorities, whether it's kids or family or work. They, they can't really dedicate the amount of hours that they, they want to um, to their training. Like I think oh, actually there's a, there's a really good example, actually, Stephanie Schindler from – uh, Florida or New York or California or wherever she's living at the moment, she is a fantastic example of somebody who can compete at a professional level after starting up a, a bit of a later later time in life. So, yeah, definitely can be done. And the second part of her uh, Samantha's question was, what advice would you would you have for recreational paddlers who want to race for fun? Well, do exactly that. Go down, have fun. But I think you're going to have fun if you're a little bit fitter. You're going to have fun if you're on a little bit of a, a, a nicer, a, a race, a racy board um, and, and something that's going to be able to paddle um, quite easily through the water. Um, if you're paddling on a an older style, I don't know, 10-6 wide uh, or 35 wide board that's really slow and you see all your races go past you, that might be something. But if you're just racing on a recreational board and you want to have fun, then I guess just go out there and have fun. There's there's no real limit limitations to that one. Um, but fun will be depending on what your idea of fun is. Is if your idea of fun is winning races, then you probably want to be on a race board. If your idea of fun is just having a chat with your mate and floating along the 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 ocean and looking at the beach and looking at people paddling past, then a recreational board and a, a, like a simple standard paddle will be fantastic for you. So. Yeah, you just got to work out what your level of fun is. My level of fun wouldn't be necessarily sitting at the back of the pack on a, on a rec board. But, um, yeah, we all have our, our different goals, and I think I will definitely get to that point. Uh, Martin, g'day, Martin, from uh, Bali. Martin is from at the moment, French guy. What's your advice to be a better paddler? Um, training alone for so long, and I feel like my performance is still the same. I think find a good coach. Find a good mentor. Um, if you're doing the same thing over and over again with the same result, what do they say? It's the definition of insanity. So if you can find somebody who can help you get better, whether that's a, a local paddling group, whether it's an online coach, whether it's um, just somebody who's super passionate about paddling or passionate about training, there are people who probably can help you outside of stand-up who can make you a better trainer as well. So there's all these different things that can't come into it. But if you are struggling, reach out for help. 
Uh, if you want to get better, reach out to somebody who can make you better because there are those people out there and there are people who do that as a job. So there's definitely somebody you can somebody you can do that is, is me if you if you want to reach out and we can sort something out. Um, Yvette has asked, is my natural ability to turn faster than on my backhand? What would be your number one tip at perfecting a boy turn? I've actually got a um, little competition at the moment on booth training uh, from the 27th to the 7th of April. The person who does, um, I don't know, the best buoy turn and, and gets a lot of engagement will be winning a free month training with me. So something you guys can get involved with. Um, but as far as the um, fastest turn on my back end, I actually turn natural and goofy. Uh, for whatever reason, that's just what I've ended up doing. Unless I'm in the surf zone where I can't do it, then I'll have to turn um, backhand. So my number one tip for perfecting a, a buoy turn would be practicing a lot. Like when you're at the marina and there's a lot of um, boat mooring buoys, go and turn around that. Like pick a course and just go around, do that, do as many turns as you can. Like I think I was pretty notorious at the start of my stand-up career when I when I first got involved. I was pretty terrible at, at buoy turns. I remember racing Danny Ching in a race, and we ended up having a bit of a a bit of a I don't know a chirp at each other because I, I kept paddling really fast to a, a buoy a buoy, and then I'd fall off, and then I'd turn, and then I'd paddle again, and then I'd fall off, and then I'd turn and paddle past everybody. So, and they were all getting getting upset with me for falling off, and I kept saying, "Well, you need to paddle faster." So it was um quite a quite a funny one, but yeah, the best the best way to perfect your turn is is practicing lots, and there's there's multiple stepping techniques you can do, whether it's um, the cross step or the, the side shuffle or the you can jump back and step back. There's a few of those different ones, but key thing would be always make sure you're looking where you're going. I think that's super key when you are doing a buoy turn and doing short little sharp strokes. I know there's like really fun um, ways when you're getting really good, you can, you can turn really quickly, um, but um, no, that's not... Um, that's not probably the, the easiest way to learn how to return, but I definitely recommend going out to the marina, falling off as much as possible, and getting um, better at your buoy turns that way. Uh, Dave Schliefer has asked, was I surfing Noosa Dua Bali with the boys last season, pre-COVID bombs with Zane Sutwidor? No, Dave, that wasn't me. I was actually supposed to come over, um, but the borders were closed in Australia at that point, and I think a few of the fellas like Zane had to fly back to Hawaii really quickly so I was in a way lucky I didn't go across because I, I know how hard it was to get for a few of those guys to go to come back um, after after that trip but I was supposed to be there um, but I couldn't I couldn't actually make it that, that trip okay so I've got a message from Greece thanks for tuning in can I can I narrow down a race board as long as you maintain the right volume for your size and it still be efficient um, so I think we're talking about board widths here. So I think for generally a wider board, it's going to be better for most people. So a lot of people get caught up in their board sizes. So generally you want a wider board that's more stable because that's something that you're going to be able to stay on and paddle for longer periods of time. Um, and when it gets messy or choppy, you've got that stability. I think a lot of people are really racing to get narrower and narrower and they've, now they've almost, almost gone back out a little bit because they've realized that um, they can't, they can't actually stand on that board. So when you're, actually, when you're paddling, you want to be able to stand on your board and feel comfortable because if you can't stand on your board and feel comfortable, you can't put proper pressure down on your stroke and you're not going to be able to propel your board forward in effective, in effective motion, really. So that's just something that you're going to have to learn. I think taking your board out, even if it's your flat water board, take it out in like really choppy conditions. Your, your choppy water board, take it out in flat water conditions, um, side wind conditions, head wind conditions, like all these all the conditions that you think are the worst conditions you can possibly go out in, I think that's the best way to, um, if you want to narrow down your race board, you've got to be able to paddle your board in those um, tricky conditions. That's always the best way to do it. Um, but yeah, you can narrow down the race board if you maintain the right volume and size, but it won't be efficient if you can't stand on it. So you've got to work out, I guess, skill level versus uh, volume versus, um, I guess, being able to stand on the thing. So yeah, a few different factors there, but there's always different ways to uh, work that out. Um, Choppy Waters has had to leave the call, but thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, just remember, guys, this is interactive, so if you do have any questions on anything that I have said, um, any training, racing, um, recreational tips or anything like that, please please ask away. 
Um, I'm going to just jump back over to another question over here. What's the reason Star would have increased their volume to other brands that have lowered it? Uh, well, I think on the race board side of things, I find personally that more volume always works better. Yes, low volume boards can be fine on flat water, and you can, but as soon as it becomes a bit of chop, you get a lot of water across your deck, and you're sort of getting thrown around a little bit more. Um, with the, with the more volume, you sort of tend to be more buoyant through the chop, um, which allows you to be fast in more, I guess, in more areas and in more um, different conditions and that type of thing. If you go too low volume and too narrow and, and all that type of thing, you tend to really suffer. And I'm I'm actually one of the guys who's putting more volume on boards because I, I do find that I like the the volume on boards that little bit more. Uh, I know the sprint in the past years I've always been layering it up that little bit more to get that little bit more buoyancy um, and to make it more effective in those different conditions because then we can start playing with the rails as well. So when you when you're in the swells and you want to you want to turn that board on its rail, if you've got a really low volume board, you're not going to be able to really shift it as much because there isn't much board to move around. So um, yeah, that's that's a key thing for me. All right, so guys, I'm actually through all the questions so far, unless it's not loading properly. Oh no, we've got another one. So uh, Raul has asked again, thank you for tuning in, mate, and thanks for all the questions. It's really good to get lots of talking points. Um, on blade area, what is ideal? Shall we consider paddler's weight, strength? How do you suggest to select the right one? Yeah, this is an interesting question. So. Overall, I think someone else actually asked the question here as well, so I'll be able to answer both. Um, stiffnesses in shafts, I think, are really important. And probably the most important thing out of um, blade versus shaft. I think people focus a lot on their on their blade, but they should probably be looking at their shaft a little bit more. So a flexier shaft, I find, is, is actually quite forgiving and quite good to be efficient over a longer period of time for distance racing. Uh, when you're doing more sprinting so like i think something like a 45 with starboard is quite good for distance racing or a 40 and then if you wanted to go to 30 or 35 um, for sprinting you can do that because what happens is the stiffer your shaft the harder you're going to work your muscles the flexier your shaft the more you're going to be using your aerobic system so that's the that's the sort of the the balance you've got to find when you are doing your selection of your paddles then we start to bring in the blade size. So blade size for me, around that 85 to early 90s mark, I think has been pretty good to me. But you really need to test paddles out as well because um, when you look at 90, when you look at all these different paddles, 90 is just a number. Same as 24.5 or whatever it is, it's just a number. You've got to jump out there and feel it and feel what it feels like because when when you're looking at different brands, and I've done it a lot because I have sort of had a paddle brand as well. The numbers don't necessarily mean anything, but like if if I were if I'm sort of looking at a starboard lean at the moment, I've been testing them out a fair bit um, over here, and I'm working with the starboard team a little bit now with their newer blades. But the 21, oh, sorry, the the Lima 21, 93, and 87 are the ones that I'm trying trying at the moment. So that's an XXL and a XL. And then I'm going to be trying the large as well with the 45, 40, 35, and 30 shafts. So at the moment, I'm finding I'm liking the XL Lima with the 35 shaft, but I haven't tried out the other ones yet, so I need to sort of get a good bearing of which ones I'd like. So coming back to actually your question, um, how do you choose your paddle size? I think it's got to be done on weight, it's got to be done on strength, and it's got to be done, done on ability. So at, at the moment, I guess my ability is high. So if like I like to look at things in like, I don't know, you ever played 2K um, on PlayStation and you go on, you pick your basketball play and they've got all these different stats. So in SUP, you've got to have ability, strength, power, endurance, speed, and, and weigh that up for yourself. And then go, okay, so if I'm really strong, I'm probably going to be able to pull a bigger paddle. But if my fitness is not quite there, that, that bigger paddle's not going to work for as long for me. And then if my blade's really stiff, my big muscles are going to get really sore really fast. So maybe I need a more of a, um, a flexier shaft. Um, if I've got lots of speed in me and I'm only doing sprinting races, then a bigger blade is going to be more effective. But if I've got lots of speed in me and I'm doing an endurance race, I might really have to go down to a smaller blade so I can actually maintain that speed for a longer period of time. 
And then if I'm going into, if I've got lots of endurance, then maybe a, a smaller paddle is going to be more effective. So you can actually paddle and do more strokes over a longer period of time. So there's a lot of things to actually weigh out. And I think if you did a, 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 a map or something, it would just be like this crazy cross-section of so many different things trying to line up. So basically what I would suggest is, is try lots of paddles, is find out one that suits you and then try different um, strength shafts, try different size blades, try different handles, that type of thing. It's all going to make a difference in the, in the end. But with all of that said, the best paddle for you is the one that you use all the time. That's it. That's that's the best advice I can give. If you have a a 40 um, shaft with a with a new Lima handle and a an, an 87, and you paddle with that all the time, and you only paddle with that, just paddle with that. That's going to be your best paddle. Um, but if you start to try and okay, I'm going to use this paddle for this condition, and I'm going to use this paddle for this condition, and this paddle for this condition you'll find that you're not going to really be that effective because that 1% that you gain by using that paddle, you're probably going to lose it because you haven't been using that paddle enough. So, yeah, lots of different factors to consider when you are choosing a paddle, and that's the same thing, those little stats I was talking about for board sizes and that type of thing. You've got to know your ability and you've got to know where you stand. You've got to try lots of different pieces of equipment. Well, um, I don't see any more comments, guys, but if, if you have any more, I'll probably do this in another 10 minutes or something like that, and we'll make it an even hour. Um, but it's been a pleasure talking to you all so far. Um, so for me, I guess I might as well talk about myself while I'm on here. Going forward, um, I think I mentioned before, going over to Europe is, is my plan. Um, I do want to get over there and compete. Whether I can do that or not depends, on, I guess, on the Australian government and, and allowing me to get across. I've still not been vaccinated or anything like that, so I'd like to have a vaccination before I head overseas. Um, also, I think I'm going to be doing a lot of um, podcasting again, probably once a week. I'm going to do something like that. So if you can, the podcast, check out Boothcast um, on your favourite podcast channel. I'll head over to Michael Booth and you can watch all the videos back. I sort of interview um, SUP paddlers, surf ski paddlers, um, business leaders, that type of thing. So I love the comparison between business and sport. Um, and then I've been doing, uh, continue some coaching down here at Serena Surf Club, which has been quite fun. I'm um, sort of being a bit more hands on with, with coaching and sort of using skills that I've known for a long time and, and helping people get better. That's always fun. A lot of training with, uh, booth training, which has been amazing. Um, that's something that I'm really focusing on. I'm really helping, um, yeah, push, push forward, um, with, with all the training and then, We've got a clothing label that Christy started, uh, desirdevoyage.com.au, if you want to check it out. Uh, it's just women's clothing. So that's been a really fun thing. It's starting to get a little bit of legs and starting to get a bit more traction, uh, selling more things, which is really fun and, and sort of a different challenge. But um, Christy and I are really enjoying that. Um, and then I've got another question, which is great. So I can stop talking just for the sake of talking. Uh, Samantha has asked again, where is a good place to go test out all this gear? Our island is more of a windsurfing island. We don't have many SUPs. Uh, that is really a good question. Uh, if you've got a distributor in your area, that's always ideal. Um, I get I'll, I'll, Rothio or someone, if they're on online, maybe you can help Samantha find a distributor around her area that where she can try out these different boards or where, she, or you can just go check out stardashboard.com uh, and you can find out more information on all those different boards and gear. Or you can... That message me afterwards and you can ask more specific questions on what you're trying to find. I've got a couple of emails here already. So michael at michael-booth.com.au if you do want to send me an email. I can just, they're just here because I've got another email set up that had all the questions listed for me. Um, Chris, thank you so much for chiming in all the way from France. He said he's missed the Australian champ in France and in Europe. I've missed coming to France and coming to Europe. It's one of my favourite parts of the world, and I've spent a lot of time there, which has been fantastic. Um, who am I afraid of for next year's races? I don't think I'm necessarily afraid of anyone. Um, I think I would really enjoy racing against everybody and, and testing myself against the best athletes. I, it's something that I definitely learnt in, in 2020. I do really want to... Um, race really hard against the best guys you know, when it all counts and, and when it's all on the line. So that's something that I'm looking forward to. But who do I think are, are going to be strong coming out of COVID? Well, I think the guys who are strong going into COVID are obviously the ones that probably are going to be good again. Uh, I think guys like Bruno Hasulio, Daniel Hasulio, 
uh, Connor Baxter, Casper Steinfarth. Um, I think the young guys like Clement Colmos, Noit Garoid, um, Ty Judson, Lincoln Jews, obviously super strong. Uh, all these guys are, are going to be really good and strong again on the global circuit. But yeah, there are, hopefully, hopefully there is new guys coming through who are going to test us out. There's always um, a real challenge, I think, to see what what's coming through, and you're always nervous leading into each and every season. You're not knowing what to expect, not knowing who you're going to be racing against. So, look, I'm just excited for the challenge. I, I'm excited to train for an event that's actually going to happen and train for one that means something, you know, like it's going to be really big on a global stage, stage and sort of having lots of country represented and you sort of feel like you're really doing a, a, a global tournament, which is something I think in now in my 30s, I think as I mentioned it before, something that you you really want to be doing because you might not be able to do it forever and you, and you might not be able to do it to the extent that I've been doing in previous years. Um, yes, and come to Switzerland. Yes, I would love to come to Switzerland, Peter. I don't think I'm going to make it in time for the ice race. Uh, I think it's a bit too early for me, but... Uh, I do hope I can get to Hungary and, and oh, hopefully back to Europe towards the end of the year. Um, Sergio has asked, interval training or long distance without rest? Sergio, can you can you further that question and just uh, um, tell me what you're training for? It's always interval training um, for me, uh, the, regardless of what I'm training for, whether it's uh, technical racing, distance racing, sprint racing, you definitely want to be doing interval training. Uh, just it's definitely more effective, but there is a there is a time for just going for a long paddle, um, like downwinds, or, or doing for a 10 or 20k paddle at uh, low um, intensity or something like that to get your technique right and just be used to spending that time on the water, testing out nutrition and that type of thing. So, yeah, there's there's time for all of it, but 90-10 um, um, interval training over just paddling for long distances. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Rothio has just said, hey, connect your dealer distributor so you can place an order for these subs. Yeah, so I think that was for Samantha and Bonaire. If you uh, want to try and get some boards ordered over there, um, please get in contact with Rothio and she will hook you up. Well, guys, I think that's probably enough from me for tonight. Uh, if you do want to see more of these lies, let us know in the comments. Um, I, can, I can definitely do these talks if I don't bore you guys too much. Um, I, I've really enjoyed chatting to you all tonight. I hope you've learned something. I hope if there's something about me, something about Starboard and, and something about uh, any of the questions that you've had tonight. Um, really enjoyed chatting to you all and I will see you next time on Starboard Sup. Hopefully maybe a All-Star 021 little review and um, anything else. I'll be doing one of these once a quarter with Starboard on Starboard. But if you do like my voice and you do like hearing me talk, um, do check out Boothcast. Um, there's a lot of me talking on that. So, guys, uh, thanks, Starboards, up for letting me jump on here tonight, and thank you to everyone for um, asking the questions throughout the night. I'll see you guys next time. Now I've got to work out how to end this live broadcast. <laughs>